Welcome, everyone. My name is, uh, is Daniel Flatt. I'm the contributing editor at uh, Regulation Asia. Uh, and as Manish said on the prior session, this is a panel discussion concerning liquidity risk during a crisis. As a result of COVID-19 and the actions taken by governments and businesses to help mitigate the, the impact of the pandemic, banks and other financial institutions have found themselves under a degree of pressure to manage and report on their liquidity positions and, and, and funding uh, capabilities. Regulatory requirements put squarely in place after 2008 were designed to improve bank ability to meet funding obligations by establishing liquidity buffers and to implement contingency funding plans, CFPs, to guide banks during times of such crisis. However, as, as you are all very acutely aware, equity market volatility, liquidity tightening, widening funding spreads, operational fails and other challenges across the board have placed additional pressure on bank liquidity uh, risk management, at least for certain institutions. Much has been done by sort of government and government bodies, the US Federal Reserve, for example, to stabilize financial markets, large scale asset purchases, for example, while regulators extended timeline for certain regulatory requirements, such as the current expected credit losses uh, implementation in an effort to reduce some pressure on bank resources. Um, and this has, by, by most accounts, been uh, relatively successful. The capital and liquidity buffers that banks now have in place were designed for, for similar black swan events as, to, as we see now to ensure they can support the economy during these trialling times. According to a recent report by Deloitte, many banks across the globe have activated the, their CFPs and as a result are having to report their liquidity positions to senior management at very, very regular intervals. Uh, it's, it's in this area around bank liquidity risk management where, you know, a series of interesting issues have, have surfaced. And with me today to discuss the, uh, the pain points and observations and hopefully to provide some guidance on how to sort of overcome them, very pleased to, to have with me uh, Eve Tom Ball. He's the Chief Risk Officer for Singapore for MUFD Bank. And Nadim Shamim, who is the Head of Cash and Liquidity Management at SmartStream Technologies. Hello, guys. Hi. Good day. How are you doing? Good. All right. Well, I'll start off with you, Eve, with a question. Sure. In your role and uh, as a sort of CRO, how would you define the last sort of seven, eight months? How has COVID-19 affected you? Well, I think what we've seen at the beginning uh, is clearly uh, clients kind of shoring up liquidity. This this happened more in, the, in around February to April, where we saw some uh, drawdown on committed line um, that you know was was just a, a reorganization of cash flow uh, across the uh, uh, across our clients. This fortunately we we haven't seen and I mean, I've shared this opinion and I've discussed this opinion with a, a few other treasurers. I don't think we've seen a major drawdown on liquidity that has led to anything similar to what we saw ten years ago during the Great Financial Crisis. This actually I think this is something we can discuss whether this is related to the new measures that were put in place after the crisis. Uh, but clearly, since it wasn't the case uh, this time, the, the government, the uh, central banks uh, were clearly uh, ready to intervene. And they've been, again, a uh, flooding market with liquidity if necessary. And uh, and overall, there hasn't been a sense of panic uh, that, that would have led to something that we saw before. We, we've seen a small spike in interest rate, but again here, uh, rates have back, gone back down. The, the, the situation is, is fairly controlled in there. And I think uh, overall, liquidity situation uh, within major financial institutions is, is, I believe, manageable. And, and if anything, the flags that were raised a few months ago are now tr starting to be discussed to be brought back down to more, uh, I would say, normal to regular level. Yeah, so th th that's what overall, I would say, the, the, the overall liquidity picture that, that I see now. And, and has there, yeah. I mean, that's good news, essentially, but has there been anything from a sort of just a practical perspective that changed for you? Have you had to sort of operate in a different way? Obviously, there's been social distancing, etc. Sure. Et sure. I mean, you know, very pragmatically, we obviously had to discuss how we were going to do, how traders were going to operate in this environment, having to send, uh, obviously, a, a good part of our staff working from home. Uh, so we, we have prioritized, of course, the essential staff to continue to work from the office, the ones that are doing the operations. We had to discuss how we were going to do late submissions to, uh, to, to LIBOR, to, uh, to Cyborg here in, in, in Asia. We had to discuss how, how to make it work. So we had various discussions with the right regulatory bodies on this. Uh, so we had to make some decisions. It was about, you know, having a, a strong a local uh, top-down uh, management ready to take pragmatic actions quickly. 
so mm-hmm. that was important, I believe, to have a clear differentiation of role between regional management and local management in the sense okay. to, to take the necessary decisions. But overall, I'd say the, uh, it ended up being quite smooth. Uh, we haven't witnessed any particular indecision in, in that sense. And, and most of the other either risk manager or treasurers that I've talked to have been able to, to continue smooth operations. Accordingly. You mentioned def- definition of roles between regional and mm-hmm. local mm-hmm. firms. So can you just sort of expand on that, if you don't mind? Sure. Well, I, I think it's particularly important. We know many of us work in, in the matrix reporting framework here uh, as regional quarters, usually in Singapore, whether in Hong Kong, Singapore. And these types of crises really stress this matrix reporting framework. So it's important I believe to make sure that in, in times of crisis, you have the right reporting line to make sure that, you know, the right people are accountable uh, for the right risk and, and to make sure that swift decision can be taken in these extraordinary circumstances. So obviously, I take from my own organization and we, we managed to do that quite well. I was really happy about our environment. Uh, you know, we, we've had a local CRO, you know, a framework for about two to three years now. And, and I believe this has made a uh, the overall framework, localizing the framework has made a difference from having a more uh, regional-only framework that doesn't always provide you that kind of support. I'll, I want to um, to take you up on the, the point about sort of GFC regulations. But I, before I do that, I'll, I'll just bring in Nadim. Just to, to, in your role and the conversations that you're having with, with, I assume, sort of treasurers or similar type executives, what's the what's the feedback been on the back of, you know, the, the, the pain of, of, of COVID-19? I'd like to echo what you said in terms of the the challenge of actually liquidity itself. Yes, initially there was concern around whether there'll be sufficient liquidity or not. But then you've seen a number of regulators have pumped a huge amount of liquidity into the market. They've uh, encouraged deferring of dividends and the requirement on potentially some of the regulatory reporting and stress testing as well. So it's made a lot easier for the banks to to manage their liquidity from the numbers perspective. Where they found more of a challenge is more on operational levels because the majority of the people are not have not able to work in in their offices they're dispersed whether they are uh, in their back offices in in the same uh, location or in different countries the number of people that are available to work has reduced to some extent which has meant that um, when they are preparing their daily liquidity reports for example there is a bit of a lag so there is a concern that was uh, that has been raised that it could be that the information they get on liquidity reporting itself is not up to date. It's not 100% accurate. Mm. So there is a potential risk uh, around not having the most accurate information to make those liquidity decisions. What that has meant is that they've just ended up leaving additional liquidity on the account effectively wasted liquidity. Well, Evie, I, I noticed you were nodding at that point. Do you, do you, you see some, uh, y- your own experience of something similar? No, I mean, totally agree with your point, but I think this is beyond the crisis itself. I think, uh, you know, uh, intraday visibility on liquidity has been a, a long debate that has been, I, I believe, driven by many hoped this would be driven by a regulatory push and we've seen this push to a certain extent in, in the US, definitely Europe to a certain extent in Asia. It's, it's still lacking traction. And considering the, the significant investment that it requires, it is usually, uh, you know, having a regulatory push helps you, you know, uh, allocate the, the, the budget to go into that direction. But obviously, I think, thankfully, the, the, the liquidity situation being fairly stable and, and, you know, as I said earlier, the, the, the small spike that we saw and that small liquidity request that we saw in the market was fairly short-lived and therefore we didn't need too much a buffer to take care of that extra volatility. So overall, I think it all played well. But that problem is, I think, a, a recurrent problem that we will need to tackle at some point. Okay. Um, and Nadim, I will pick you up on and, and explore further your point about operational issues. But I, I do really just want to cover possibly more out of my own sort of curiosity than than perhaps anything else, which is we've, we've talked about the, the regulations that came in, you know, post global financial crisis that were essentially you know to some extent designed to sort of handle these types of events but as as we've as we're all very aware we're still fundamentally reliant on central bank government regulatory support has, has to some extent has all the sort of preparation been put in place 
Has that really been tested to the extent that perhaps you would imagine, given given the sort of disruption that we face? I'll put that to you, Eve. If you're talking about the regulations that followed uh, the great financial crisis, if this is what you're talking about to right now, I don't believe that uh, we've been able to really test uh, LCR uh, uh, the way it was intended to be tested. Uh, we the, the central bank was supposed to leave the market a long time ago. Unfortunately, this never really happened. If anything, they've been increasing asset on their balance sheet. So, and this is unlikely to go away anytime soon. So. Except for maybe a few situations in a, in a few countries, I don't. I think most financial institutions did not have to rely on their HQLA to, to shore up their liquidity situation, which means that, uh, again, uh, we, we haven't really been able to, to test what LCR was really meant to, mm. to deliver. Again, what, it, what remains to be seen is whether the, the sale of HQLA uh, works as a, as, a, as a tool to obtain liquidity in a short amount of time. And this the selling process has never been really tested at large scale. And while if you look at Asia, most of the HQLA is really comprised of uh, government assets. But in, in Europe or in the US, a part of that HQLA uh, can be made off, uh, you know, corporate bonds to a certain extent. So uh, it remains to be seen in a situation, in a real liquidity crisis, what the haircut is going to be on these types of securities. But again, we will, we have not been able to witness that here. I believe. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. So I guess, I suppose, just to, to summarise that point, it's very difficult to know whether what we've, what we've been preparing for it is is actually sort of suitable for the situation um mm -hmm. nadine the conversations that you have what sort of sense of, of urgency do you get from clients you know are they, are they anxious to be ensuring that they've got the visibility on where their their, their cash fundamentally is or where they can get hold of it yes it, it is becoming more important and certainly on the interest in liquidity the conversation is getting a bit more active uh, mm -hmm. around understanding exactly where is the liquidity, not just where it, it, it is, what is the liquidity that they have, where are they expected to have a liquidity crunch during the day. It's all very well saying at the end of the day, my book is square. But what if your uh, liquidity crunch happens and you haven't received sufficient uh, amount of credits from your counterparts? Mm -hmm. How do you ensure that your obligations are met on time and without any delay? I mean, that has a significant impact on various other uh, elements but so that's that's becoming more more of a, a conversation with our clients the other conversation that is is more actively is that they're, they're more interested in finding out how can they do the stress testing element more efficiently i know we're going to touch upon that a little bit later on as well mm -hmm. but i think that is what used to be and it's in some cases still considered a regulatory burden mm -hmm. they're seeing the value of that on a bau process Provided that they have a process in place that they can, they can um, move the levers around to see what impact the, these changes have on the liquidity itself. For example, you start um, you know, stressing a certain liquidity, a certain counterpart, or a certain correspondent bank, or the available liquidity on on your balance sheet, or the impact of uh, of collateral uh, and the market value of that collateral. How does that change the liquidity? And because the situation is unique in some ways to his point that we haven't really tested the old regulations that, that have been put in place and the, the framework that has been put in place because it is a unique situation it's not what was yeah, last yeah. time so th there isn't a, a formula or a guidance on how to address this so they've, they've been able they need, they need to be able to test different scenarios more effectively more efficiently and more rapidly okay well carry on that point so how how are they doing that what sort of what what methods were they applying and what questions are they are they asking to sort of to handle this when you know in, in terms of stress testing is it to me or to Eve? No, to Nadine. Uh, carry yeah, on. Uh, all right so uh, what have and i think Eve would be able to tell uh, more directly from his experience as well is that uh, the standard was yes let's set up the the bcbs 244 scenarios and the focus was usually on on own stress or counterpart stress. The rest were very difficult to put in place. To to be honest, it's very difficult to say what what impact it would have on uh, my liquidity depending on the market because that just becomes using analytics to potentially predictive analytics, uh, machine learning elements of it. But it's it was more operationally focused around the impact of of changes in available liquidity to, uh, to me 
or the lack of uh, funds coming in. That's an easy one to manage. Mm -hmm. Once that was put in place, it was almost operational. Do it once a month or once a quarter, it was done and dusted. Now, if I was talking to another large bank only recently, and they said, okay, we've got a good process in place, but if I need to change one of the elements of this particular uh, stress, for example, change mm -hmm. account, a certain counterpart, which is delaying payments, it can, the, the amount of data that, that needs to be modified and the sources that need to be modified, it can push back my uh, reporting of that stress by up to seven to eight weeks. That is not dynamic enough, quite frankly. Mm. It doesn't help the, the uh, treasury team to actively address or the risk team to actively address the impact of rapidly changing environment. Uh, Eve, in terms of stress testing, what, how, have you, how have you sort of operated in this environment? Any, any changes, any different sort of approaches, any, any slight ticklish issues that you no. need to, to iron out? No, no, we've, we've taken it to account as we, as we always do, the, uh, the, the volatility in the market, and we, we, we've expanded that, extrapolated that to, to see how a portfolio would, would react. But again, when we saw early on that the signs uh, of stress were fairly manageable and we were not looking at the crisis that was going to derive towards what we saw uh, 10 years ago. We were confident that the model that we had in place would, would allow us to see the crisis through. And mm. we continue to obviously uh, monitor very, very closely the liquidity situation across across the globe. I think what's particularly important right now, beyond, uh, I would say, short-term funding liquidity, is funding diversification. Because okay. that that has a more l long term impact, and uh, it's harder to steer uh, when you're taking a wrong direction than uh, than I would say short term liquidity, where we see that in the short term liquidity we still have a very very uh, liquid and, and ample market. There, I think uh, you know stress testing, concentration monitoring uh, is very important. I hope, and we've seen the government, Singapore's government, uh, starting to issue long term retainers as well. Uh, I'm hoping that the market in Asia will continue to become more liquid. Uh, so that uh, you know, uh, treasuries across the globe can better diversify their their portfolios and and ensuring to have both a, a regionally optimized portfolio, but at the same time sufficiently liquid locally to to meet regulatory requirement and, and and local needs. I certainly wasn't expecting to sort of say this during this this session, um, but it, it it seems that. What we're facing, at least from, from what I get from you, is another perfect opportunity to adapt and evolve without necessarily the, the huge uh, impact of a proper liquidity crunch. And, you know, th there is support, there is, there is good guidance, there is at least some, some clarity. It's a good chance to, to keep testing the, the situation. You mentioned, obviously, funding diversification. I, I, I take from that comment that perhaps there are financial institutions that might be holding, I don't know, I'm guessing, but a lot too much corporate debt or something like that. Is that what you're, you, you mean? Well, that's that's more around the, the asset allocation. I'm more talking about how you're funding your book uh, overall. As we see right now, actually, uh, uh, you know, volatility in deposits. You can end up with concentration of deposit with certain names, uh, certain currencies, where you need to be particularly careful on how you're going to use this. Again, the, the lending market right now, we have to be particularly careful. The impact of COVID-19 is still unclear. The length of the crisis is still unclear. Many names might end up uh, facing difficulties in the future, and it's not yet obvious. So we have to be extra careful when lending out uh, in the current environment. And obviously, we need to be there for our clients. We need to analyze this carefully, but at the same time, continue to be uh, you know, long-term partners with, the, with our clients. So, so this analysis is particularly important. And therefore, how you're going to allocate the mm. funds you receive is even more important. We know we have it in a, in a low interest rate market that is likely to stay like this for the next probably five years, which means that the curve is also going to fa fa fairly slap, flat, if not inverted in some areas, which means managing your net interest income is, is extremely important as well. And that's where I believe the importance of funding diversification uh, I would say curve management, cash flow management is, is particularly important. Okay, thank you, N Nadine. We, when we spoke um, a few a few days ago, you, you you introduced to me sort of four major sort of observations. I think that you saw from the the, the, the sort of COVID nineteen around. You know, you've already sort of covered a little bit the intraday reporting. I think you mentioned issues around knowledge gaps, credit risk, and stress testing. Could you could you take me through that again? Because I thought that was very interesting, those sort of four components and, and just your your broad observations on that. You, you put it down to in um, 
in, in two groups, I would say. One mm-hmm. is around the operation side of it, right? So the knowledge gap is is quite visible what I, from what I see and from what I hear when people are not sitting together and there are juniors working on a particular task. If they get stuck, they don't have somebody readily available. They have to actually reach out to um, to a colleague through Teams or, or another electronic channel as opposed to just get up and walk and ask for a, for help. So that, that knowledge gap means that, uh, again, Correlation of data and making it useful uh, information is slower, and there are uh, there could be some errors around that as well. The other element um, is more about uh, the the regulation and the reporting as well. So the, for the BCBS two for it reporting, the challenge has been around again gathering data and getting the information correct and having the timely information around it as well. Now, the issue around stress testing is that uh, I think we touched upon that already in terms of saying, you know, where exactly the impact would be on my liquidity itself. So Eve mentioned about credit risk as well. And and we don't know how long this particular uh, scenario will last. And if large elements of your credit book starts to default, that has a direct impact on liquidity itself as well. So that there is... Uh, interlink between credit risk and liquidity risk. So I think those are the the, the key components around that as well. On the on the issue of of, of sort of stress testing, we've actually had a, a question come in from the audience. Mm. So I guess it might make sense to sort of sort of bring that in. The question I think the question is essentially do 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 you know or does anyone here have an insight into how the regulators are going to design new scenarios for stress testing? So I guess any indication of of how one might go about this is 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 does that sort of is that something you can answer either of you two no there hasn't been any visibility uh on this uh, at this stage we haven't had discussions on that again covid has, has turned out to be an extremely unpredictable crisis and it's very difficult at this stage to be able to uh, to see how this will impact liquidity going forward i i believe what what the change that i've seen is that regulators are a lot more hands-on in managing the banking exposure. I've never had so many meetings uh, with regulators than, than now. We, we've moved from, I would say, more formal meetings uh, where we would have a particular subject that would be discussed, prepared a couple of months in advance to having almost bi-weekly meetings where we're discussing okay. ongoing situation, ongoing exposure, questions around it, which is great. I mean, it allows us to have a lot more nuance to, to, mm-hmm. uh, to explaining the situation and, and develop a stronger bond with the regulator, but at the same time, it's also very taxing for regulators. I don't know how long they've been; they will be able, uh, uh, in their current resources, to to manage this this amount of scrutiny. Again, an area where I believe liquidity, uh, sorry, technology, uh, will help in the future. We're we're still very much in an environment where the regulator sends you, you know, requests for data, and we react and provide the data, usually in very, you know, ineffective format: spreadsheets, email documents uh, okay. when we i hope that the next five years we'll see a, a leap forward in technology where regulators will be able to just use an api and plug into a, a read-only uh, framework of financial institution read the data that they need to read and run the scenarios that they want to run and then have discussions around the results if we want to have a more dynamic framework that is able to na- analyze more quickly these types of crises. this is where we need to go. The technology is here. It's just a matter of uh, finding, I'd say, the industry standards that all parties are comfortable working with and then choosing that technology and moving forward. And I- I'm very, very strong that the MAS will probably be again, uh, MAS in Singapore will probably be again one of the leaders in this space going forward. Yes. Yeah, so Yes, so please. Just to James just to add to that, I think that there is a lot more conversation going on inside the organisation because there aren't any specific guidance in terms of um, or regulations coming down the line which says the stress tests that you need to carry out are X, Y, and Z going forward. Banks are now looking more and more. Say, how can they create the what if scenarios? What if scenarios are becoming more and more regularly used than it used to be to carry out stress tests and different elements of the group is being stressed. And it used to be, again, you look at the LCR uh, and SFR, which was uh, being uh, looked at. Now it's going further, uh, shorter period, going into intraday liquidity as well. So they're looking, to Eve's point, they're looking more and more towards technology to see how can they help 
this linear element of it, but then also how the newest uh, technology, mm -hmm. the likes of artificial intelligence, machine learning can actually add value or provide them with tools to have a more flexible way of understanding what's happening to their liquidity. Mm -hmm. uh, granted, that is a little bit further down the line because nobody want, uh, in, in, in a financial uh, organization wants to purely rely on machine learning and AI because it's still seen as a black box, especially when it comes to regulatory or stress testing around it. We, we, um, we don't have to go this far. Uh, uh, as mm -hmm. you said, right now, if we could already uh, shorten the time between, uh, you know, the moment the regulators mm -hmm. comes up with a, an industry-wide scenario and gets the result, mm -hmm. that would already be a, a major improvement. Right now, uh, it takes a regulator probably six months to mm -hmm. get the results. And those results might even be based on data that was already three like, months oh, old. Yeah. So you're talking nine months. We're in a different world. Uh, and just because of the way data is, is produced, you have to leave banks three, four, five months to produce the results because it has to go through, I don't know how many uh, committees to get approved, yeah. to get verified. We, we need to do something there to, to not so much working on, on the quality of the scenario, but much you know, quicken the pace of results mm -hmm. so that we can just run more scenarios, which will dramatically improve the results. Yeah, which is, uh, you, you just validated my point early on saying that the, the, the time it takes to prepare scenarios is, is, uh, is, is quite long. And especially if you start making changes to the uh, scenarios, it's very difficult. And the scenarios then depend on that as well, because people are mm -hmm. very scared of using a scenario that is too extreme. Yeah. If yeah. they know it's yeah. going to take nine months to get results. So you end up, you know, coming with very consensual scenarios that are, mostly historically based on the recent event, you know, in major countries. And you end up with a result that is not much further from, you know, the current past of the current environment and not really yeah. what I would call a stress scenario. If anything, it's just an, a slight extrapolation of the current environment. Yeah, and I think you need, to be, you need to have a tool that says, right, I define what my liquidity pool is, and that can vary depending mm -hmm. on my uh, uh, test that I want to do. And then look at what the different tests there are, whether that's reduction of, uh, of lines or, or uh, delay in payments or as some uh, change in market value or ring fencing some of the liquidity. And then you can apply filters to say, how do I change the filters around it? It needs to be more flexible, more user enabled as opposed to uh, here's a piece of paper defining my scenario. Send it back office. They'll bring it back, as you say, Eve. Uh, yeah. Eight months later, you might get something. Yeah. And and this is not just for uh, the relationship between the regulator and the financial institution. This is also important between the financial institutions and their clients. Mm -hmm. You know, we're also currently in in a, in a fairly similar data relationship with our clients, where we will request a lot of information before the inception of a transaction. But once the transaction is in place, it's a lot harder to run a stress scenario on an exposure or getting sufficient data, uh, you know, because, you know, it, it, that, that kind of flow of information is not available. If, if financial institutions were to develop, you know, tools made available to their clients to manage their liquidity, it also provides them with the, the visibility on the data to better anticipate future cash flows at the same time, provide products to the clients by mm. having a better visibility on the future cash flows and at the same time, having a much better uh, understanding of the, the cash flow profile of that client. So it's a win-win situation where technology can play a major role and where, and that's where we be, have to be very careful, especially incumbent institutions have to be very careful, where digital challenger banks right now have a, a huge leap forward uh, in technology. That's where they're aiming at and where the you know, incumbents have to be very, very careful uh, careful to continue to invest in that direction if they want to stay relevant. So in terms of, the, 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 I, I get the sense there's a bit of a sort of disconnect between um, what now, what happens now and what your vision is. And you mentioned mm. that they, it doesn't need to be necessarily as complicated or as futuristic as, as you know, we, some, some might expect. But what is actually, is there, has there been any sort of indication or any sort of advancements where you're seeing you know the, the the capacity to disseminate information a lot faster has there been anything in your institution where you've seen ah this is working better this is a product of technology and we're making a you know we're seeing positive results well i, I think all institutions are investing you know regularly in improvements and i'm not going to talk specifically about what we're currently doing but you know what i continue to see overall in the industry is that large investments 
I would say bold investment that require large top-down decision are usually, unfortunately, regulatory driven. When you have to make a big change, you need a large regulatory support to be able to justify the investment. And uh, at the moment, that regulatory need uh, requirement is not there. You're not being forced by a bank to invest in a particular platform or technology because I don't think we have a, a common understanding yet on what that platform would be. Okay. So what banks can do right now, of course, is to, uh, I would say, invest on their core infrastructure, simplify their core infrastructure to be ready when that, com th that technology will be requested by regulators. Uh, so provide have a sufficiently flexible enough platform so that you can, you know, plug yourself to that uh, that requirement going forward. So that down the line you don't have to come up with a patchwork investment that's going just going to to plug inefficiently to your technology. But you have a platform that is sufficiently recent enough and and flexible enough that you can you know implement this quite smoothly within your organization i'll bring you in in a minute just nadim because i want i want your comments on that as well but um you just want to i'm thinking about it how or is it necessary but how often are you communicating with your your peer group so you mentioned the regulator and I, I always assume regulators are a pretty good sort of nexus for what's going on in the market but how do you how do you find out what you know another CRO at a different institution is is working on? Do you, do you have any insights there? Do you think it would be valuable to have a better level of communication amongst uh, people at the front you know the front line? I can only talk for myself. There are a series of, of, of uh, I would say forums and platforms available for CROs to discuss ideas. We have the Asian Risk Council here in Asia where we meet most of our peers. Uh, there are there are different opportunities to do so but you know again the regulator here can play a role uh, associations can play a role and singapore is again an example in that area because of the abs is, is playing a huge role there on on uh, bringing you know the the organization together on deciding what the what the next technology or investment in and step forward will be so yeah yeah nadim your thoughts just good, touch, touching up, uh, on uh, the previous comment, I think it's all around data. You need to have, mm -hmm. I think banks need to start investing in to make sure that they have tools available that gather all the data into one place. So it becomes a single source of information, be it for your day-to-day -day operational requirements, be it to stay within internal policy guidelines so you can be alerted of any breaches, be it uh, to to get warnings if you are, holding excessive liquidity that which could be in effect due to a fraudulent transaction or an, an erroneous transaction as well because the the current challenge you've mentioned as well is that around legacy systems are uh, that uh, that major banks have are impeding the timely and accurate reporting now that is a a big challenge not only for short term liquidity but also intraday liquidity near term liquidity and it is it if you have the data guess what, then you can actually bolt on to all the new technologies around it, whether that is using a state-of-the-art stress testing tool or using machine learning and, and uh, predictive analytics to say and predict what time the unsettled cash flows during the day would be settled. So you understand where the liquidity crunch points might be or potentially failed payments as well. And that is, it's all around it. So I think banks need to invest in a technology platform that brings all the data together that actually helps get a, puts a ring fence around the the risk of not having the right information and you can build on it as mm -hmm. and when and, and you mentioned that as and when the regulators come with a new regulatory uh, requirement if you've got the data in place, guess what? You can actually deliver those requirements more effectively and more quickly. That sounds... Yeah. Um, no, after you. No, just just saying. Of course, uh, getting the, having the data is is absolutely paramount. But also having a system that delivers that data in different format quickly allows you to play with that data uh, effectively. And uh, we've seen countless examples of systems that weren't built to provide a certain data mm. in a certain format, and we end up having to bring in another new system to chunk that data into another format. So I mean, these are all. You know, yeah, you need to be able to get real-time reporting topics, at the end yeah. of the day. <laughs> These are all old topics that we've talked about in many areas. Obviously, uh, technology, the, the technology is there. I think now it's more about finding a standard that works for the for the community, for the investment, uh, the financial institution community, and and move 
together towards that. Are there any other any other reasons why this hasn't happened? Because what you were describing, Nadim, certainly sounds sensible and in, in, you know I wouldn't say intuitive, but somewhere around there. But it hasn't happened, and I, I am I've been speaking about this subject for, for long enough as well. It doesn't seem to have developed too far. So why not? I mean, it's, is there? It's is there any- too. If if uh, hit the nail on the head, there hasn't been a uh, regulatory imperative to get that information and uh, mm-hmm. use that information more effectively. It's been the the requirements have been a little bit delayed, deferred. You don't really need to report in real time basis because the requirements are you do on a quarterly basis or on an annual basis. Well, that and usually by the time you deliver it, you're several months down the line anyway. So as the regulations, well, let's see if that does happen, change uh, that you need to report on in real time, a real time basis, I think the uh, the focus will change. Absolutely. Okay. Um, unfortunately, I think we're sort of just about out of time. And I, I thank you very much for both your input and insights. I just have one sort of quick question. Is um, based on your, your point, Eve, earlier on about basically, you know, government supporting the system. If that was, I, I know it's perhaps an unfair question, but if that was all taken away tomorrow, would we be in a very serious situation? Well, this is really obviously extremely hypothetical. I believe that we are in a much better situation than we were 10 years ago. Uh, the overall relationship between front office, middle office, back office has completely changed. There's much more equilibrium between the front and middle. Therefore, the, the, the focus on liquidity uh, has increased, uh, um, you know, liquidity buffers have been shored up to levels that we have never seen before. Leverage leverage is much lower than what it used to be. The prop trading is not what it used to be. Uh, you know, uh, black box portfolios are not as prominent as they used to be. So we're not likely uh, to see a, a liquidity crunch like, like we saw uh, before. But in the hypothetical situation where we were to have a, a, another Lehman, I think clearly that LCR helps because instead of central banks being forced to lend unsecured in the market, they'll be able to repo out most of their transaction, which obviously puts a lot more uh, security in the overall market and stability in the overall market. What my question mark remains, as I shared earlier, is in the ability to transform your HQLA into, into cash in, in sufficient short amount of time that you can sustain uh, the, the, the liquidity crunch. Um, that hasn't been tested. And again, I hope we don't have to <laughs> ever test it. But overall, clearly, we're in a better situation than we were before. Nadim, just 30 seconds from you. Would you, you sort of, what's your point, your, your view on that? Well, I think uh, because the, the uh, regulators have um, uh, flushed the market with so much liquidity, they've not really had to test uh, the, 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 the liquidity at all. I mean, let's face it, if it gets pulled away, you've got the, the buffers in place. That's what they're there for. They'll be challenged. And let's see how quickly they can use that. I think it is totally hy- hypothetical. Oh, I know, I know. I know. Banks, they, they've not stepped away and they wouldn't. It's politically incorrect <laughs> for them to stay, step yeah. away. <laughs> and to be fair, the, the system wasn't built for them to, be, to step away. Uh, HQLA by definition, requires the intervention of central banks to transform these assets into cash. So it was never the intention of completely stepping away, but more into, uh, you know, I think responsabilizing institutions into shoring up the liquidity so that they have a pool of, of, of uh, high quality assets ready to be, uh, to be invested and therefore make them more accountable for their liquidity position. And I think that definitely has worked. And we've seen how stable the market has now been and now central bank have this tool of saying, look, we're, we're going to provide the liquidity, mm-hmm. but be careful. We could, we could request for these HQLAs. Yeah, okay. yeah. We're, we're going to manage our cash flow a bit better. Very good. Gentlemen, thank you so much for your time. It's really appreciated. All the best to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.